Welcome to One Life Church today. My name is Sarah Inman. I'm on staff here. And normally I start out um, each one of our services with a video letting you know about some things going on around One Life Church. I'm going to do that here in this moment as well. And then also I just want to take some time and welcome you today. Um, if it's your first time visiting with us today, that's super amazing. We'd love to get to know you. There's a couple ways that you can let us know that you're here. You can just hop over to our chat, which you'll see on your screen right now if you're watching live, and just say hello. Let us know it's your first time here or go to onelifechurch.info or hit the button that just popped up in the chat right now and let us know you're here through that connection card. Uh, just lets us know a little bit about you and we'd love to actually get to know you a little bit better. So we'll connect with you later this week. Um, you know, we are in this process right now of what we call digital engagement. Even in this service right now, if you're watching live or even on demand, you're part of engaging in a digital way. We know that's part of the future. It's part of the way that we're trying to just get better. We're not experts yet, but we want to get better. And so what we want to do is not just have this one hour a week on Sundays to engage, but find other digital ways to engage as well. Maybe some of you are already in um, growth groups that are meeting virtually. That's incredible. We want to create another space for you to just be able to just connect with people um, at any time. So there's a lot of ways to do that. One, the first thing that we want to try out is doing a Facebook group. Now, the first time I say Facebook group, some of you are like, nope, I'm in way too many of those. People keep trying to sell me stuff. That's not what this is. This really is just a space where people can come in. Um, anyone can join from the, our online platform here or anyone at any of our campuses and just come in and have a place to ask for prayer, connect with something that's going on in your life, or maybe share an article or a worship song that's really meant something to you. Or as you're reading through the Gospel of Luke through a True North, True North series, you want to just share something you learned that day. That is incredible. We want to create an engagement opportunity for everyone to be a part of. So um, you can go to the button that just popped up into the chat window right now, or you can go to onelifechurch.org. Just scroll down to our locations and you'll see One Life anywhere there. You can join the Facebook group there. I'm asking actually everyone to join it. It'd be really great for us to have a place where we can engage, not just here on Sundays, but anytime during the week. We want to continue growing that platform as well. So maybe if you are interested in being a part of our digital engagement team, fill out that connection card that I just mentioned at onelifechurch.info and let us know. We'd love to get to contact with you and find out some ways that maybe you can help us just get better at engaging people in this space as well. You know, some other things that are going on around here at One Life Church. August 9th is the date that we're really saying we want to get back to kind of what we're going to call reopening. Uh, we have been open. Our services and our buildings have been open for one service at 10 a.m. Um, each week for the last few weeks. But on August 9th, we're going to be relaunching kids ministry. Uh, and that's exciting because we know that so many of you are waiting for that for an opportunity to come back because you're like, what do I do with my kids if I come in a room and they have to sit with me? It's kind of weird. We get it. But we are working on that. We're going to do our best to keep social distancing distancing in place and create a safe space for us to worship together and your kids to have a place and people to engage with them as well. So August 9th is the day that we're shooting back for. We'll have uh, times and dates and all that information or times for that date coming up for services. There'll be two services um, at each campus, which is really exciting. We'll also still be doing 9 and 11 here on our online service because this is a place that I'm passionate about, Josh Stanley is passionate about, and we'll hear more about Josh here in just a few minutes. Now, also, uh, the Global Leadership Summit. Every year here at One Life, we really talk about the GLS a lot because we know that impacting a city, impacting a community takes leaders and everyone has leadership in them. So that is an opportunity that we're asking everyone to check out. You can go to onelifechurch.org slash GLS. Um, you can register right now, actually, for the GLS. It's going to be virtual this year, which means you can watch from anywhere, kind of like you're watching right now. You'll have access to all the talks for up to a week after the uh, GLS is over. But what's really great is if you're watching with your team, maybe in a conference room or uh, maybe with a group of friends, you can actually have conversation in the moment right after that happens. So it's going to be a little bit different. We love being in the community together. We know um, down at uh, our buildings in Henderson and, and Evansville um, in downtown spaces, being able to be around people around the community. But this is an opportunity we have to still be a part of growing our leadership potential um, with the GLS. So check that out. Every year or every week we start... Um, our services with a time of worship through singing. And worship really is an opportunity for us to say, I need to just stop everything that's going on in my head and, and have this moment of what I would say is even surrender. And there's this moment in this song, there's a lyric in this song that says, here I stand high in surrender. And I think about that in a moment because the word surrender feels like something you see in a movie or a book or a TV show where someone puts their hands up and they're saying, I give up. 
That's, and that's not in the sense what we're doing with God, but we are putting our hands up and saying, I surrender completely to you, God. I have faith in you, and I want to walk in that faith um, all the rest of my days. So if that's you today, if you're just looking for a moment to just stop and get a breath and just moment of surrender and listening to God, uh, man, we would invite you to join us right now. Or maybe you just want to read the lyrics and just kind of maybe process it for the first time, maybe process things about faith. That is incredible too. You have an opportunity to do that however best for you to respond to God today. Use these next few moments to do that. So let's worship together. Hi, everybody. My name is Lindy. Uh, we are worshiping from my house today. And um, actually, I asked my friend Jeff here uh, to help us out. Uh, my husband is behind the camera. Uh, and so we're it's just kind of a joint effort to worship um, together today. Uh, I hope that this is meaningful for you and that it's just a time where you can just settle in and just spend some time just worshiping Jesus together.
So as we begin this next song, it's called Waymaker, and I was just thinking about the series that we're in. Uh, and in Luke chapter 1, there are two people, Zechariah and Elizabeth. And Zechariah is a priest in the temple, and part of his priestly duties are to go into the temple and to pray for the people. And um, in that moment when he's praying, uh, all of a sudden an angel appears to him and says, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth would bear you a son. And there is more to that story, but I think my takeaway as it relates to this song is that first, this prayer was probably um, years and years prior to ever this moment happening. Uh, Notice the angel says, your prayer has been heard. So Zechariah and his wife, uh, we know from scripture, had struggled with fertility uh, and the hope of ever conceiving children. I would say they probably placed it in the hopeless category. Um, And I was thinking about this song and how many of us um, have some prayers that we've just placed in the hopeless category. What was set in motion that day was proof that one, that God had been working in the unseen, And while their story may be different than yours or mine, um, I think we can all trust that God is at work in you and through your circumstances, um, even if it may look a little bit different than Zachariah and Elizabeth. So as we begin this song, um, just allow that to kind of move you into just a place of um, maybe God is asking you to take a prayer that was in the hopeless category and move it into um, trusting and depending on him because he truly is the God of hope. Um, So we're going to begin this song. Who you are, 
That is who you are. 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 See you. Even when I don't see you working, even when I don't feel that you're working, you never stop, you never stop working, you never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see that you're working, even when I don't feel that you're working, you never stop, you never stop working, you never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see that you're working. Even when I don't feel that you're working, you never stop, you never stop working, you never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see that you're working, even when I don't feel that you're working, you never stop, you never stop working, you never stop, you never stop working. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Hey, I'm Mark Weaver. I'm with uh, Sarah Inman, and Sarah's uh, director of our creative arts team, and uh, she's been behind the camera and doing the mixing and things. And so we were just talking about, um, hey, giving. Imagine that, generosity. And I said, well, what are some things that you would like to to ask uh, from your generation, from your life experiences uh, about giving. And so she doesn't see this one coming. So I'm just gonna ask her to tell us her story or her short story about uh, giving. Oh, wow, you're right. I did not see that coming. <laughs> That's a good one. But it, it's, it's good, I mean, and, and I've talked about some of this from, from stage and, and even when we talk about generosity because I think it's important for anyone to have their own experience in that. I mean, to be able to, like, I want to learn from people like you, Mark, and, and other people, um, but also having your own experience, you can't teach experiences, you have them, right? Mm, so for me, um, it kind of goes back to, like, I can go back to thinking about generosity as a kid growing up in church. We always sat in the balcony. We were the balcony people because we came in late. Um, and so there were a few friends, but one of the things that I always loved doing is every time it would be uh, time for the baskets to be passed, because there were baskets at the time, um, my mom would get the checkbook out and my brother and I would kind of argue who got to write the check and then she signed it because there was something about being able to do that. And I don't think she maybe did that on purpose, maybe she did, but knowing that you're kind of instilling in that thinking like this is something that we do and you see the amount mm -hmm. every week and it's not just something that... Um, um, I don't know, it just, it felt real, you know, something. So as I got older, especially when I went to college, I, I didn't 
I literally didn't have an income. I mean, I was, I was, uh, my room and board was paid for, my school was paid for, and I had enough money to basically get food. Um, and uh, so I didn't know how to do that because I was like, I know that's part of, of how to do that give, how to give, like yeah. financially, because I know that's being obedient um, and something that I think is valuable. And so I started realizing, but I have some other things in that time. I mean, when you're in college, you don't think you do, but you have a lot of free time that you don't have yeah. after you're out. And so I started finding ways to, to serve or gifts of my time. Um, and I started working with students, and that was, gosh, 12 years ago maybe. Um, Is that a good choice? It was a great choice. <laughs> uh, there's been times where it's been, you're like, I don't know why I do this. And then I get reminded even now, just last night, got a phone call oh. from a student. Uh, she's in college now. And she's like, hey, I just wanted to check in and talk to you and I haven't heard from you. And there's something even rewarding because it's a friendship. I mean, it's it's beyond just like me pouring into her, but she's now sharing her experiences. Ah, yeah, and it's been it's been good. Something just uh, the just a, a brief takeaway from that is is too often when when we talk about generosity, we talk about giving. It seems to degenerate or get down to just money, mm -hmm. but we have time, talent, and treasure. So there's a great example of somebody taking the time and the talent under the Lordship of Christ and giving yeah. into the kingdom that way. And I had told you this earlier as well. I mean, it, and it wasn't a thing that once I started working, I was like, oh, well, now I'm just going to stop giving yeah. up my time. Yeah. It was like, no, now I, I, I see the value not only in, um, in giving up time, but also mm -hmm. I want to give financially to continue seeing this happen, to see more people pouring into the next generation mm -hmm. um, and them feeling like they have a place to belong and a place to, to ask questions. Okay, so I think so just uh, to wrap this up, a thank you. And uh, it just, I'm continued to be reminded and it's just like, wow. I know that with Cindy's and our giving and, and everybody who's watching this, they give, this is, <laughs> this is an awesome opportunity to see what God's doing uh, because Sarah is immensely gifted. She's called to this particular ministry, but this is part of what God is doing through our giving of, of our monies, uh, we're seeing what he's doing here. And it's affecting everyone that gets to, to be a part of these, these videos mm -hmm. and the online uh, at One Life. So um, will you pray for us? I'd love to, yeah. Father, we thank you just for, I just continue to thank you for opportunities to, to just have conversation with you, with each other, to grow together. Um, to learn more, God, I pray for us to not be um, stationary and thinking that we can't learn something new. And so, Father, even in this midst of we talk about the joy of generosity, I pray for more opportunities to see the joy in that and it not feel like something that is a burden, but a genuine joy uh, to see the fruits of that. So God, continue to teach us, continue to lead us. And um, yeah, just we pray that whatever is given financially is given for your glory and to make your name known um, in our communities and all throughout the world. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you. Uh, on the bottom of your screen, you will see the ways that you can give to One Life. Again, thank you. My name is Matt, and something you need to know about me, I am not really good when it comes to working on cars. I've just never learned a lot about it. Maybe I'm just not mechanically inclined. I don't know. But the good news is I have some buddies who are really good at that kind of stuff, and I don't think it's an accident that all three of their names start with J. I got Jeff, John, and Jake. If they were a boy band, I'd call them the J-Boys, which too bad none of them sing that I know of. Um, so unfortunately, that's probably never going to happen. But they are still really good at working on vehicles and knowing about that kind of stuff. So if I have an issue with one of our vehicles, I hit up one of the J-Boys, and um, th they'll help me out. And they usually don't make me feel dumb for it or anything like that. Super cool. And so maybe you have a friend like that as well. So let's imagine a story where car won't start. Call up my buddy John, 
He, he would even probably come over and, and help me figure it out and say, we started, try to start it like 12 times. We got nothing. He does his magic and figures out that the starter's gone and we got to go get a new one. I'm like, okay, I just want to try something though. And he'd be like, what? If I, I'm going to knock on the hood three times and then you're going to start it and I bet it'll fix it. He'd probably laugh, think I was joking. But what if I just kept bothering him? Like, no, we're going to try it. He'd be like, fine, let's, let's see your hood knock thing. So I'm like, all right. Knock, knock, knock. He fires it up. It's completely fixed. If that happened, I imagine his mind would be blown because everything he knows about cars, engines, a lot of the stuff that I don't know about, he was like, how is this possible, right? And he'd probably look at me and be like, what are you? You know, like some kind of like car wizard? And I'd be like, yes, I am the car wizard, John. And then it would turn into some magical adventure that we would go on. Unfortunately, that story didn't really happen, but it does kind of set us up for this interesting story we get in today in Luke chapter 5, where Jesus kind of does something similar to one of his friends. And so before we get into it, uh, you should know that we are in a series called True North, where we've been reading through the Gospel of Luke, this story of Jesus's life, just kind of collected stories that Luke put together of who Jesus is, the things he did, the things he said, his life life, death, and resurrection to help us know who the true Jesus is and how to follow him and respond with our lives. And so we've been doing that because it's important to fix our eyes on Jesus more than ever as times just seem dark and really hard right now. And what does it look like for us as followers of him and as the church to love people well? Well, we need to fix our eyes more on Jesus. And a few weeks back, our lead pastor, Brett, read um, from Luke chapter 4, where Jesus goes to the synagogue, the Jewish place of worship in his hometown, and he goes to teach. And he opens up uh, what was called the Isaiah Scroll. It is a book, um, a prophet Isaiah, who wrote this book down. These words from God gave him for his people hundreds of years previous, and Jesus is going to teach from it. And so I want to remind us of what Jesus read from Isaiah, because as Brett said, this was kind of Jesus's mission statement, and he goes out and to do his ministry. And so we find him reading from Isaiah 61, as we know it. This is Luke 4, 18 through 19. He says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recover sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And so Jesus is saying, this is about me. He actually said that. He rolls up the scroll and he's like, today this has been fulfilled in your hearing. And everybody was like, what? He, he's saying, this, this was written hundreds of years ago, pointing to me, and I'm the one who's got the power to bring all this stuff ultimately about. I'm the one you've been hoping for. I'm the, the one you've been waiting for. I am the chosen one of God. And so they're kind of astonished and just in awe of him. And then he tells them a couple of stories from the Old Testament and reveals some things in their hearts. And next thing you know, they want to try to push him off a cliff. And Jesus escapes that because he's Jesus. And then he goes into doing all this ministry out of this, not only talking about who he was as the anointed one of God and saying he could bring about all of these things, but he actually shows them that he has the authority and the power to do it, which is what we've been talking about the last two weeks leading up to this. Jesus starts casting demons out of people, showing that he has authority over the spiritual realm and that the demons are afraid of him. And so then Jesus starts to heal all kinds of sicknesses and, and, and lots of people showing that he also has full authority over the physical realm and, and things of that nature. All these things that cause fear and darkness and sadness in our lives. Jesus says, I'm over these things. He's showing us who he is, who the true Jesus is, is the God of all these things, especially the things that we think are are bring us pain and suffering. And so we've, we're following Jesus and we're paying attention to him. And each week we've been talking about what to fix our eyes on Jesus and, and to learn from that. And this week it's this, fix your eyes on where and how Jesus reaches people. Fix your eyes on where and how Jesus reaches people. It's important as we read these stories and as we get into the story today to see where Jesus goes and how he uses that to reveal himself to people so that they ultimately will know him and, and, and become in a relationship 
with him. And so we started out, he was in the synagogue, the place of worship, the religious place, but he's also in the marketplace. He's out in fields where people follow him out in and he also is in someone's home. In one story specifically, he's, he's in a home and he heals Peter, one of his followers, mother-in-law, from a fever. And so Jesus is in all aspects of life. He's not just on Sunday mornings or whatever. Here's where you get your Jesus. Jesus shows that he reaches people. He pushes his kingdom out. He brings his light everywhere. And that's important to remember as we get into what we're getting into today. And it's, I think it's also kind of interesting that one, the only story that tells a specific person's healing is it's something, one related to Peter. Because the story we're getting into today relates specifically to Peter as well. And we want to see how he responds to who Jesus is today and what we can learn from it. And so um, here's a picture of where our story takes place today. It takes place at the Sea of Galilee. You've read much of the Bible, the New Testament stories. You've probably heard of it. You know that they fished there, that they did a lot of things around the Sea of Galilee. Some interesting stories happened there in the Bible. But here's what it looks like, just so you can kind of picture where our story is taking place today. Um, and so keep that in your head. And let's read from Luke chapter 5, starting in verse 1. It says, One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Genesaret, also known as the Sea of Galilee, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He was at the water's edge. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. Always remember that Luke adds in specific details to give you more context and a little more understanding of the story. And I think the fact that they're washing their nets right now is something to pay attention to, and we'll get to that in a minute. It says, he got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, that's also known as Peter, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Okay, so that's the start of our story. We've, we know we're at the Sea of Galilee. We know people have come there to the sea now. This is one of the places um, where he's reaching people, and they've come to hear him teach. And Jesus is crowded, so he gets out into this boat. And what's super, super interesting is in the mid-1980s, there was a drought around this area, and the Sea of Galilee receded and exposed an ancient boat that they were able to uncover. Here's a picture of what's left of it, and it's a pretty good uh, amount. And it's about 27 feet long, about seven and a half feet wide. So you can get an idea of kind of the scale of it. It was really a shallow kind of flat boat so that it could go out into the shallow water. So Jesus could kind of be there just offshore teaching in this thing. And Jesus does just that. And I, and I imagine Peter just kind of being like, okay, cool. Jesus, you know, he's this popular guy. He's using my boat to teach from. And Jesus, you know, he's this carpenter turned preacher. But now uh, Jesus is kind of telling Peter how to fish. And that's why the cleaning their net story is important because that means that they were already done fishing. And so it picks up in the story here. Peter is going to uh, respond to Jesus' request to put out the nets. He says, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. Well, when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. All right. So I don't know about you, but I'm processing this. I'm, I'm seeing the picture of the boat, the Sea of Galilee, and just a ton of fish being able to like tip these boats and, and, and almost bring them down as they're trying to drag all these fish in. And they're probably just amazed because did you hear what Peter said? They had just got done fishing. See, what everybody seems to know, but Jesus, is that um, when you fish in the Sea of Galilee, you do it in the evening in the shallow water. Uh, but Jesus is telling him to do something complete opposite of what these guys, who are the experts, know to do. So that kind of ties into the story I told you at the beginning. Jesus is like his version of knock on the hood and try to start. He's like, hey, how about we throw out in the deep in, in the daytime here and see what we get? And Peter's like, are you serious, Jesus? We're tired. We just cleaned our nets. You know, they, they put their tools away. They got them all cleaned up and ready to go um, for the next night. And he's asking them to get it all back out again. And there must have already been a relationship there with Jesus because there is that where he calls him master. He has this kind of relationship with him. And he's like, okay, because you say so, 
uh, we'll do it. And, and some commentaries think that Peter is being a little snarky here and he doesn't think anything's going to happen um, with this catch. Um, but to their surprise, it's probably the most fish anyone's ever caught ever, especially in this time of day and in, in, in times where they shouldn't catch anything. There's a miracle that's happening with the fish, obviously, but the bigger miracle that we need to pay attention to in this story is what's getting ready to happen in Peter and the other fishermen's lives. Um, Cause I, I know how I would have responded to this story. I would have been like, dang, look at, look at, look at all this fish, right? Like having Jesus around, this is, this is going to be good business for us. Jesus can do miracles and we can catch fish any time of the day. We don't have to stay up at night and do it. This is, thank you, Jesus. You're about to make us, our life good. You know, like that's what Jesus is trying to do, right? I don't think that's what Jesus is trying to do, but that's how I might respond. Another thing, way you could respond is that like, oh man, we are the best fishermen ever. They've completely forgotten that they couldn't catch any fish yesterday, but now they've got a big head and they're going to tell everybody how much fish they caught in the middle of the day. And suddenly, maybe you've done this. I know I probably have. They're taking credit for something in their life that they should be giving full credit and glory to Jesus for, but they're getting people to praise them for it. That could happen in this case, too. Or maybe they're, they're looking at the other fishermen and thinking like, oh, okay, God is blessing us with this miracle fisherman. Maybe there's, we're good. And all the other fishermen, they're, they're, you know, bad sinners and they're not as loved by God as us. Therefore, that's why they didn't have this miracle catch. So you start comparing yourselves to others. And none of those are the response that we get from Peter here. Actually, we get this beautiful, fascinating response that I think we can apply to our lives as well. Let's pick it up. It says, when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus's knees and said, go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. So the other two who had the other boat they're all just astonished. And, and can you imagine the scene? You've got this boat and it's full of fish and guys and they're trying to get all this together and fish are flapping everywhere and there's water coming in and Peter's just hanging on to Jesus's knees and he is just in complete just fear of him and, and saying, Jesus, get away from me. And I just imagine this, this image of Peter's response. And how is Peter responding to Jesus, to this miracle, to who Jesus is. He has had this full revelation now of who Jesus truly is, as Jesus is Lord over, you know, the sicknesses. He's Lord over the spiritual, but he's actually Lord over everything, all of nature. And Peter has been seeing Jesus do these things. He saw Jesus heal his mother-in-law. We don't get a response like this recorded, but suddenly Peter is on his face. And he responds, I think it's interesting, he responds with fear. He, he asked Jesus to, to, to leave him because he's sinful. He's, when we see ourselves and we see Jesus, God, for who he truly is, we realize that he is holy, he is other, he is perfect, and we are not. And Peter cannot bear to have Jesus in his presence. I wonder if he's reminded of another passage from Isaiah where Isaiah is in the presence of God and he asks God to depart from him. He says, because I'm a man of unclean lips who's around people of unclean lips. He, he said, basically, I am not worthy, God, to be in your presence. And in their culture, they would have had this sacrificial system and they were, had to have all these things happen, all these mediators between them and God to make their sin go away, to be right before God. And God dwelt in the temple in this one specific room called the Holy of Holies. And we've taught about this before, but no one was allowed to go in there. But one guy, the high priest, once a year to make what's called atonement, to, to make a way for the God to forgive the people's sins and to take them away. And all of a sudden, Peter's like, I'm in the presence of that God. I'm done for. And, and, and it's in one sense, it's gotten this beautiful act of worship. In another sense, it's sad because that's how they thought they should respond to the Lord of the universe is just in pure fear. But that's not how Jesus asked them to respond. That's not how Jesus responds to Peter. I love how it picks up in the next passage. Then Jesus says to Simon, don't be afraid. 
From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore. They left everything and followed him. They pulled their boats up on shore. They left everything and followed him. And Jesus said to him, you don't have to be afraid of me. I think that's a beautiful picture. As we see Jesus as God in the flesh coming to fully reveal himself to us. How often have you felt like Peter where you have done something that is wrong or made a mistake or you think about past mistakes and you think, okay, God, you're probably done with me. I don't deserve this. I don't deserve to be in your presence. I don't deserve your forgiveness. I can't walk into a church service. I can't go to my group right? Have you ever felt that way? You felt the shame overcome you for your sins that Peter is saying he is a sinful person. We all sin in in what the Bible says, fall short of God's glory. And so sometimes we can fall into focusing on our sin rather than remembering God's grace, his forgiveness that he offers, who he is. And Jesus is in right now is teaching us exactly what that looks like. When Peter says, I'm sinful, Jesus doesn't say, yeah, get away from me. Here's your judgment. He says, no, I want you closer to me. He says, I want you to follow me. I imagine him reaching down and grabbing Peter by shoulders and picking him up and looking at him in his eyes and even just telling him he loves him because he's showing him that right now. Now, And this is not just a call and an offer to Peter in a story 2,000 years ago. This is a story that Luke wrote down because that offer is for us right now as well. To forget about everything we've done, we struggle with, our struggles, our doubts, because I promise you, Peter was, did not become a perfect person in this moment. In fact, far from, as we continue to see his story play out. And Jesus took him right where he was and says, I want you. Jesus makes that possible, not us. That's why it's called grace. It's a free gift of a relationship with God that he would earn for us by living the perfect life that we can't live and giving his life for us as the one and final sacrifice for sin on the cross. And he offers that new life that he just offered to Peter. He offers that to us right now. And he offers us for us as Christians to not walk in fear of sinning and disappointing God. He can't be disappointed because everything you have ever done wrong, he died for 2,000 years ago before you ever did it. He sees you as his child and he wants you to walk in that first and foremost in all that you do. And that's freedom, not fear. And that's a beautiful thing. And that's what he calls Peter to. That's what he calls us to. And I love this because Peter saw that God is Lord over every aspect of life. And I imagine that the reason why we see Jesus going into this place with Peter is because maybe Peter was like, I'm the expert here. This is my domain, Jesus. You know, I know how to fish. You're a preacher. You're the God man. But I got this fishing thing down. And Jesus is like, no, Peter, this is where I am too. And you're going to serve me here, and I'm going to show you that, and you're going to follow me. How many of us right now think that we have an area of our life that we are completely in control of, that we keep God excluded from, because that's our area of expertise, not his, and we don't allow him there. God, you know, you're just in my life on on Sunday mornings, or in my group time, or in my Bible study time, or, you know, when I need you, then, God, you're the expert. But when I go to work, that's, that's me, God. I, I got that. Or when I'm in this friend group and, you know, they don't really talk like this and, and they, they don't think about things of God. And, and so, God, I'm, I'm going to exclude you from that because that would be uncomfortable to have you be Lord over that. Or, or God, this relationship, I really like this person. They don't care about you and they don't really, they kind of push me in ways that I don't, I'm not comfortable with, but I just really want them in my life. So I'm going to exclude you from being a part of that so I can try to find, have control over that and find happiness there. God, I'm just scared that if I let you have control over my finances, then things won't go well for me financially. So I'm going to not trust you in that. I'm going to take over that because I need control there. And Jesus says, no. He wants to reveal to me and to you today that he is, has authority over every single aspect of our lives, every single realm, and he wants us to give that over completely and fully to him. Here's why. Because he created us 
to have a relationship with him. He created us to image him. And Jesus came with the mission statement of ushering in the year of God's favor to bringing in the kingdom of God, to bring hope, restoration, forgiveness, and healing. And he wants me and you, everyone watching this right now, to play a role in that. In order to play a role in the most important thing that we were made to do, we have to give God the authority over every aspect of our life, even if it's hard. And he promises he's got you because he alone is the one who can promise to carry us through those things, to give real and lasting meaning to those things that isn't temporary like we most of the time experience when it comes to physical things and relationships. And, and sometimes they're good, sometimes they're bad. And if we're honest, we never really have control. Jesus says, give it to me and watch what I'll do with it if you truly trust me and let my spirit who's inside of you guide you into those moments. It may be uncomfortable at times, but I will show up in ways that you couldn't possibly imagine. And imagine if we give ourselves over to him in all aspects of our life, how God might use us to spread his light, to spread his hope, to reconcile our world together in new and powerful ways, our cultures, our cities God will do awesome things if we will just give him that and just say, yes, God, yes, you are God. I am not. Take it. I'm tired of trying to control it. It's frustrating if we're going to be honest. We never really have full control. We're learning that in our culture more and more all the time. Let's just give our lives fully over to him. So here's what we're going to do to respond to this today. I want every single one of us who would call ourselves a follower of Jesus, one of his disciples, to just process this and think, is God revealing that one place to you right now? And if he is, I want you to make a move because you could be feeling that right now and be kind of amped up and be processing and be emotional about it, but not do anything and not even think about it the whole rest of the week. So right now, if you're watching this live online, I want you to click the live prayer button. Just do it. There will be a prayer team member or somebody on our staff. It may take a moment for somebody to get to you, but I want you to tell them the area of your life that you would like them to pray for you, for God to bring his authority into that life and ask with them for God to do it. The church is a people together, living this out together. We all have an area of our life, so there's no judgment there. Every single one of us has something we need to pray to God for right now. I promise you that. If you're watching this in a service right now, I want you to have a conversation with someone you came to church with after this about what, what God is laying on your heart or, or grabs one of our staff or hopefully maybe somebody of the prayer team is, is in our services right now where you can talk to someone. If you're, if you're watching this later, tell someone in your family, tell a friend and, and reach out to somebody. And if you don't have anybody, you can contact One Life and we will talk to you through any of this stuff because we have to continue to follow Jesus more in our lives. Not so that we can live a good Christian life and we can feel better about ourselves, but so that we can play a role in bringing the hope in his goodness and forgiveness into our world more than ever. And he wants to do that through you. He doesn't care what you do, what your position in life is, um, how successful or not successful successful you are, what you look like. God has a plan for your life and he can reach people. He can make you a fisher for men right where you are if you're just more attentive to, to who he is and giving him that authority over those aspects of your life. I'm going to pray for us and then um, we'll continue on. God, thank you so much um, for your grace. Uh, we all need it so much, Lord. And um, God, I am just excited um, right now for what you're doing in people's hearts and in, in my heart too. Um, God, make us brave. God, show us the people in life that we need to show your love to, your forgiveness, your grace. Show us where we need to um, change and ask for forgiveness and repent and, and, and to make moves in our life that show that you are truly Lord over every single thing that we do so that we can shine for you and bring your goodness and your hope into our world more and more. We ask this in Jesus' power. Amen. We just got to hear Matt calling us out to take an opportunity to pray. Our prayer team members are here. Our staff is here. We would love to pray with you today. You can use the live prayer button that's on your screen, or you can go to onelifechurch.org slash prayer at any point during the week. And we'd love to be able to connect with you even just through email and connect with you maybe in another way to pray with you. Or maybe you just have someone in your room, in your space right now that can pray with you. Maybe this is an opportunity for you guys to pray as a family, pray um, as friends, as groups of people together. That would be incredible an opportunity because we know that that's the way that we're just calling out, saying we surrender again to this moment of God. We trust you and we're asking these things in your name. 
Guys, I love that we have the space to be able to engage digitally. I love that we're able to get to know people even more, be able to stay connected in a world that just feels a little bit different. But you know what? Let's just own it. Let's just get, be a part of it. Um, Josh Stanley is uh, has been part of our team as the Groups and Connections Director in Henderson for the last oh, two years or so. And Josh is now taking on this role of Director of Digital Engagement because we know that this is something that we want to continue doing. And Josh is very passionate about it. This past week, I got to talk to him a little bit about what we're talking about with this Facebook group. And I want you guys to see that. And then right after that ends, we're going to be going into uh, the op- our, our virtual lobby where we can have some more conversation together. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Take an opportunity, have some prayer today. We love you and we can't wait to see you next time. Yeah. So the first thing that we're trying out, and um, if you are part of my Henderson family, you may have experienced a little bit of this already. Um, but we are rolling out kind of a, a digital community that's going to live on Facebook right now. And it's just going to be a place for us to interact with one another. And, and so as we've been kind of figuring out uh, some of the bugs and, and experimenting a little bit, basically what this is designed to be is just a place where we as a family can pull up a seat at the table and just be with one another. It's not a place where we're just going to continue to, you know, push out different uh, communications and, and content. But really, it's a place for us to be in a community together. Absolutely. And so again, this is not a place just like our, you can go to any of our other campuses, Facebook page or the One Life um, Church Facebook page, and you're getting information about what we're doing and how you can connect and be involved. This is a group where you can connect with other people as yourself, ask questions, talk about the message, or maybe even just talk about things going on in your life and have digital engagement in a new platform, a new space to be able to just stay connected. And ultimately, we'd love to start building teams for that, um, whether it's for our online service uh, or it's social media. Um, we would love to have you a part of that and be inside of a community Community where you're still discipling, being part of discipleship with each other, but also helping people um, far for God, trust and follow Jesus through creative uh, media and ways that we're engaging digitally. So Josh has been championing that. We're really excited about all the new ways coming with that. So have more information, but we want to start that conversation. If you are interested, uh, first of all, I would ask, invite anyone to join the Facebook group. Um, if you're online right now, you'll see a link in the chat. If you are in one of our buildings, you can go to onelifechurch.org. Should be on the homepage there. Just go down for One Life Anywhere. It'll take you that page. Join the group. We'd love for you to be a part of that and just start engaging with one another. Anything else, Josh? No, I I just can't wait to see everybody there. Uh, No matter where you are, we can do this thing anywhere.